potentially dangerous wires buried in almost half of the passenger planes flying today. September 2nd, 1998, a humid, thunderous night at New York's JFK Airport. Swiss Air Flight 111 left on time just before 8.20 p.m. It headed north towards Canada. There were 229 passengers and crew on board. And for almost an hour, it was just another uneventful flight as the passengers settled down to the usual diet of drinks and in-flight magazines. Then, 56 minutes after taking off, just over the U.S.-Canadian border, something began to go terribly wrong. The pilot signaled air traffic control that he was facing a serious problem, smoke inside the cockpit. The pilot was one of Swiss Air's most experienced. He requested an emergency landing in Boston. Then he was told to go to Halifax, Nova Scotia, which was closer. The plane was at high altitude and heavy with jet fuel, so the pilot circled away from Halifax to lose altitude and dump fuel over the sea. The plane then resumed course toward Halifax and an emergency landing. Then, disaster. Both pilots advised ground control of the need to land immediately. Seconds later, radio contact was lost. Then, the pilot lost control of the plane. Six minutes must have seemed an eternity to those on board, as Swiss Air Flight 111 spiraled out of control, plunging from 20,000 feet towards the dark seas of the Atlantic. Just 16 minutes after the first sign of trouble, Swiss Air Flight 111 disappeared from the radar screens. But this tragedy may turn out to be a defining moment for air safety. The painstaking work of the crash investigators could have major implications for the future of commercial air travel. The investigators' early findings led them to concentrate on just the front nine meters of the plane, the cockpit, the front galleys, and the bulkhead. Investigators found heat damage from the top of the galley down. This and other evidence led investigators to conclude that there was a fire raging in the ceiling area at the front of the plane. So the Canadians are trying to piece together the tiny fragments of metal and wire in this portion of the plane to find out exactly what happened. And if there had been a fire on board, then the next thing the investigators needed to find was a possible source for that fire. One of the things you try to, to find is the origin of the fire. And what we need to do is find a source of ignition. So one of those sources of ignition energy we know can be electrical wiring. This is the size of wire that we're actually trying to find. What they are looking for are wires which show evidence of electrical arcing or short circuits. To date, we have found 13 wires that show arcing damage. The two I have just mentioned, I have a photograph here that shows eight more of them. These four wires. One of the top suspects is the wiring of the plane's brand new in-flight entertainment system, a system that has since been banned by the FAA. One possibility under investigation is that the entertainment wire overheated and damaged the main power supply wiring. Another possibility is that the entertainment wire in some way damaged the power supply cables by rubbing through the insulation coating. But whatever happened, the damage was devastating enough to take out a major part of Flight 111's electrical systems and bring the plane down. And there is the other big question. Could it happen again? Some believe that it could. Our analysis indicates that the environment and the stresses may be more severe on commercial airlines than on military airlines. Military airlines only fly a few hundred hours a year. Uh, commercial airlines fly thousands of hours a year. 
and every hour that you're in the air, the wire is shaking and vibrating, and so that the forces applied to wire can be, in fact, much greater than for a military aircraft. Any time an aircraft is opened up for maintenance purposes, whether it's uh, at a major check or a minor check or, or opening up a panel, part of the, re the requirements for that maintenance plan is that you have to inspect the wires for both what we call security and condition. That means that you have to check the wires for chafing, for um, evidence of arcing, and security means whether or not they've been properly clamped or installed. But how tough a job is it to inspect a plane's 150 miles of wiring as thoroughly as Boeing insists they must? Maintenance crews at one airline are really trying. Stay Amarillo! Fire LA! Let us do the fun! We're on our way! We fly so smooth through the clouds above! We get to that because we do it for love! Southwest Airlines in Dallas, Texas, and a video promotion to highlight the vibrant, no frills young American airline. But behind the fun is an airline that enjoys a reputation among safety experts for taking wiring issues on its fleet very seriously indeed. But even safety conscious Southwest recognizes the serious limitations on inspecting all the wiring. The visual inspections that we're doing on the aircraft right now uh, is basically what we have available to work with right now. Uh, there are other laboratory type uh, inspections that people are trying to develop now because of the new emphasis on aging wiring, but none of those are really usable in the field yet. Most experts now agree, wire deteriorates over time. So inspection becomes even more important as the wire ages. But is all the wire in a plane available for inspection? I would say that um, a large proportion of the wiring is in fact accessible, and what happens is during a major check, which can occur um, over a period of years or, or regularly over a period of months, uh, the, the aircraft is opened up and virtually all of the wiring is, is available for inspection. But this view is not shared universally by engineers who have responsibility for keeping planes safe to fly. There, there are portions of the aircraft where the wiring is almost totally inaccessible. And the reason for that is the wiring is built into each section of the aircraft as it is originally manufactured, and then the large sections of the aircraft are assembled. So completely rewiring the airplane or gaining access to every inch of every wire on the aircraft, practically once the airplane is assembled, is just not feasible. Here inside the belly of a 737, wire bundles are undergoing a formal inspection. They're looking for age wear, tiny cracks in the insulation, evidence of previous charring. Some experts believe it's an impossible job. 75% of the ruptures in insulation are undetectable by superiorly trained, highly qualified visual inspectors. You're asking a man to use his naked eyes, usually an arm's length inspection, not a magnifying thing, to go down the cables, near the places where they're disconnected before they go behind panels and inspect and find the occurrence of these fractures. Some mechanic crawls into an aircraft, looks at a wire bundle from the exterior, really can't get into the inside of that bundle, and for the most part, can't even see most of the bundle as it travels through the plane. That's fabulous. 301 people died in this inferno. This was Saudi Airways Flight 163. It was on a short flight from Riyadh to Jeddah. It became the sixth worst air disaster of all time. Only minutes out of Riyadh, smoke started to creep into the cabin. Passengers began to get alarmed. A fire had broken out in the cargo hold. The pilot decided to play safe and head back to Riyadh. 163. Go ahead, 163. 163, we're coming back to Riyadh. But by now, the flames had spread into the passenger cabin.
the pilot asked for fire crews to be ready on the ground. The plane made a routine emergency landing, but there was confusion amongst the crew about what to do when they landed. When they did land, the pilot inexplicably taxied on and on down the runway when he should have pulled up and stopped as soon as he could. And as he went on and on, the fire got worse and worse. When the fire crews got to the plane, they couldn't get the doors open. It was almost 20 minutes before they got inside the plane. And by then, everyone on board was dead. May 11, 1990, Manila, a Philippine Airlines 737. An explosion and fire destroyed the plane on the ground. Eight people died. March 17, 1991, Canada, a Delta Airlines TriStar, a serious in-flight fire in the passenger cabin forced the pilot to make an emergency landing. November 24, 1993, Copenhagen, a Scandinavian Airlines MD-87, a severe fire on landing burned through the fuselage. The plane was badly damaged. December 8, 1998, Lusaka, a British Airways 747, fire broke out on the ground when wires arced beneath the passenger seat. Just this fall, final conclusions about the crash of TWA Flight 800 over Long Island resulted in a sweeping proposal to address what the FAA describes as the fire triangle, the combined factors of ignition, fuel, and oxygen. Concerns about electrical arcing will come under increased scrutiny. Similar lessons from Swiss Air 111 could bring about major changes in wire regulation and perhaps make air travel safer for all.